Hello everyone. I would like to thank you for the kind invitation to give this lecture. It's my pleasure to be here today. Uh, last time I was here lecturing was in 2005 and it was for the Archaeology and Art History Department. And I have some memories which I would like to share with you when I saw this incredible uh, I don't know what you call it now, the electronic name of it, this uh, electronic board. It took me back on a memory lane on my very first lecture in 1998 with my archaeology student. I had, I had a room transferred from the Genesis room, transferred into a classroom, and I was hoping to give my very first lecture. And when I arrived, to my disappointment, um, there was no board. So I had to mind all the way through my class. And then the second time, I think my microphone is not okay. I shall continue. So I went into the classroom. There was no board. So the second time I went into my second class, there was no chalk. And the third time I went, I was so proud of me. I had a box of chalk, all colorful, and I was going to draw and design everything on the classroom for my students to understand what I'm going to talk about, all this stratigraphy. So I walked into the classroom, shaking the chalk, saying, I've got the chalk, we're going today. And one of my students, really disappointed, pointed behind me, saying, Hojam, we have a problem. I turned around and looked, and the blackboard has been changed into whiteboard. <laughs> so in my despair, I turned around and I said, Ali, from now on, we have no problems in this department. We have solutions. And I don't know how that happened, but I threw the chalk box into the bin, and it went right in it. And you should have seen the shock of my students in their face. Everybody was shocked. And on the third class, I was able to control all of my class. From then on, I gained their respect. So what did we do? Being Cypriot, everybody has a car. We crammed into the cars and we drove in two minutes to Enkomi, Salamis, and we spent the all three hours of class in the, in the outside, uh, actually doing and practicing. And I remember sitting on the rock and we decided we would have a picnic while we were out there and spend the whole day. What a wonderful decision that was to establish an archaeology department in this university, in this country. I thought, my God, what a vision. Now, of course, 20 years ago, this is what happened. And now when we look today, unfortunately, this archaeology department that I served for eight years is no longer. But we have to think positive. We have to think that what this department gave us. And today, I'm standing here in front of you to tell you that that department achieved two things from my point of view. One is the fact that all the students we trained, 95% of them, are today serving for the Commission of Missing Persons, excavating, working towards peace in this country. This is something that we should not underestimate. The other 5%, they work with us on the Taposu excavation, Akantu excavation. So in a way, they also trained in this very project that I'm going to talk about, the time, the place that the seeds were put into ground, and now it's flourished into an archaeo park, was made here, right at this university. So things are changing. We should not be this desperate. But we should just see that from time, it was at the time there was a reason for that department. And for me, the reason was that I would do this project. And 12 years later, I would come here to share the fruits with you and what I dream for this project. Today's lecture is going to be a little bit of a patchwork because I thought if I go into directly explaining to you about Archaeopark, I'm going to look really bad in front of architects talking about architecture. 
And then I thought if I talk about core archaeology, you're going to fall asleep and you, there are no back doors, but you're going to start leaving. So I decided I'm going to do just like what we say in Turkish, little, little in the middle kind of thing, but try to give you some information about different things so that you make a sense of how I came from a little rescue excavation and training excavation to an archaeopark idea. Today, we have really monumental sites in the world that doesn't need to speak. You don't, I don't need to explain you anything. They speak for themselves. Machu Picchu in Peru, there is Stonehenge in the UK, Colosseum in Rome, and Baalbek. These sites, when you go and start walking around, you don't need any information. You are just overwhelmed with it. <coughs> I figured it out. I'm a prehistorian, not technologically good. Having said that, there are some exceptional prehistoric sites that speak for themselves. Gömegli Tepe, a 10th to 8th millennium BC site with monumental carvings, the world's first temple. Gömegli Tepe in Turkey is right now in the list for World Heritage Site. This is very important. So, remember this. Çatalhöyük, another prehistoric site in Turkey. It's part of UNESCO World Heritage Site. It has houses with wall paintings, mother goddess figurines. It's prehistoric, but it has something to give you. You can look at it, you can understand it, you can be impressed by the thousands of figurines, wall paintings of how people lived and hunted and worshipped thousands of years ago. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Now, coming back home, looking at the south, Kirokitia, another prehistoric site, another UNESCO World Heritage Site. Kirokitia, is the only prehistoric site that's on the UNESCO list for Cyprus. The rest of them are churches. And in beginning of 2016, I gave a lecture saying that it's biased because if you have churches and one prehistoric site and a few classical sites, they should have at least had Halasultan Teke in this list. But today, this morning, something, something told me Go and check the website, and today I checked it, and in 2016 they had put Hala Sultan Teke on this list as well. But usually prehistoric sites are left outside these lists. At Kirokitia, excavators, uh, they built reconstruction part of the village. Now the actual site is on a hill. So it's difficult for handicapped people, and we archaeologists, and like you architects, we have to think about children, handicapped people, elderly, blind even. We have to think about all these um, people as well, which make up part of our society that's often forgotten. In the north of Cyprus, Cape Andreas Castros, a Neolithic site, was bulldozed. This was because of misunderstanding and miscommunication between the two parties, I'm told. But of course, here is my point. Prehistoric sites are not visible. So when you go in there with your machinery, of course you bulldoze them and you think there is nothing there other than stones. The irony, excavators of these sites are the excavators of Kyokitia World Heritage Site. Another site in the north, prehistoric site. It's right next to the beach of Acapulco Beach. If you want to go and see it today, you will not be encouraged. In fact, you will be discouraged to see it. Uh, Acapulco expanded its restaurant on the unexcavated part of it. When excavators left, 
1974, during the travels, all the trenches were left open. So the walls up to four or five meters are still, perhaps not longer, I don't know, it was still standing last time I checked. But these needed to be backfilled, taken care. In minimum, the area should have been fenced. But even this was not done. So now, I will give you a little bit of pre-information about archaeology on the island, so that you can fit Tatlusu Akatu excavation in the chronology and how, how it is standing in the Cypriot archaeology. So just to be making a point, because always there are films made on Cessnola, or everybody hears about Cessnola being the male diplomats who came and who excavated or robbed, whatever. But very rarely we talk about female archaeologists who came to the island. And this lady with a hat is Dorothea Bates. She arrived at Larnaca in 1912, and she was only 19. She had a little bit of fund from the Natural History Museum, and her job was to look at the endemic animals on the island. So in her diary, she writes how she was picked up, literally picked up from the ship, thrown on the shoulder of this Cypriot guy, a porter, and was taken to the shore. And Dorothea, she caught malaria, and she went through some difficult times, but this didn't deter her. With her uh, uh, Cypriot um, assistants and the donkey, she traveled all around the island, establishing all the pygmy hippo and elephant fossils on the island. And today, if you go to the Natural History Museum in London, you will see there is one complete bone of a pygmy hippo, and that's her doing. So, what she established during her researches is that the local animals on the island are pygmy hippo, pygmy elephant, uh, hedgehog, and bat and some shrews. So we had no deers, no white pig, no foxes, no dog, no cat, nothing. All these animals came as a package brought here by human, possibly by human. And this is what we're going to look at because we will, look, uh, we will see how the farming began in the world, practically in the world, because of the fertile crescent in Anatolia. So, in 1980s, I think my girlfriend is working now. <laughs> in 1980s, um, at Agro Thierry, excavations began, and they have found bones of these pygmy hippos and elephants mixed up with human tools. So their extinction, when the 10,000 years came Holocene, this is the time Ice Age finishes and the rains and today's climate more or less has begun. And they decided the reason these animals went extinct on the island must have been because humans ate them. The other idea, of course, is the change of the weather. And these animals are always collected around lakes. And the change of weather meant less rain. Therefore, the lakes were closing in, becoming very small. So animals, more of them, gathering around it, and sudden floods and they get drowned and, uh, and uh, uh, died. This is the second climatic theory. But still, from looking at the pygmy hippo and looking at Kirokitia, 7,000, there was a gap. Because the real site, not anymore, but for 20 years ago, uh, Kirokitia was the known earlier settlement in Cyprus. Looking at its consolidated architecture with stone round houses, it must have had come from somewhere because there was nothing, in befo nothing before on the island to predate this site. And the Pygmy Hippo site is 2,000, almost 3,000 years before. So what happened in between? There is nothing. So Cypriots must have come and established Kirokitia directly. This was the idea. Then in the 90s, mid-90s, French T. 
team of experts came. They had not worked before in Cyprus, so it was a fresh outlook. Um, it was everything was new to them, and they didn't have any preconceived ideas about the prehistoric of the island. And they have found flimsy architecture. I mean, not even that. They found traces of architecture. I'm looking for a light pointer. Sorry. Okay, no problem. I will use my arrow from here. Okay. So as you can see, these are the traces and the round T's. <laughs> you can see the traces of the ar architecture usually and the places of the timber beams that was put in there. So this is what you have. So can you imagine? You have a theater in the classical sites and then you have this to preserve in prehistoric sites. But that's not the point I want to make here. The point I want to make here is that this site was dated before Kirokitia. The architecture has been reconstructed um, and they have, as you can see, poles outside, timbers, Watlam dome, uh, mud thrown in. The architecture is not as solid, it looks temporary. So we can begin to think that this was possibly the earlier architecture we have in Cyprus and Kirokitia may have developed from it. There are a lot of things to talk about this site, but this is definitely a, a must. The world's earliest domesticated cat comes from Cyprus and it comes from Shilarakambos. And here we have a burial of a man and a cat together. And more to that, they found the head statue of a cat. This is the time when farming begins. You start storing your grains and your grains are attracted by mice. And mice brings in the cat. So the domestication of the cat is a very interesting one. That It's been talked about that the cats make themselves domesticated. So now finally we come to Tatlasu. It's located, for those of you who doesn't know, it's located on the north coast. Uh, it's west of, east of Kairinia. And uh, it's, I don't know, it's beginning of Karpa as we can say that. The whole site uh, was damaged by the chicken farm. And when we went there in 96 for the first time, it was because of the Shilora Kambos excavation. They had found earlier site and they had found obsidian. And obsidian is a volcanic glass and it's sourced to come from Anatolia. And this is a very interesting and very important, important find indicating where the Cypriots may have come from. They may have came from Levant or Anatolia. But these kind of artifacts that we don't have ourselves on the island or nearby sources and that's been brought in are great indicators. So I was doing my PhD at the time in Edinburgh and I was doing survey looking at what was previously recorded and try to assess them. And I found one mention, Akatu, obsidian. I thought, wow. Akatu was in, uh, the obsidian was in fashion at the time. So I said to my students, I know a very nice beach I like to take you. It was Sunday. And they all believed me. And we went and we discovered this site and uh, we discovered it. And when we were actually driving, a JCB was coming up. So we found lots of, lot of areas that's been dug in and churned in. And we looked through this very quickly. And we found 40 obsidian blades. We found lots of picrolite, which picrolite items, which I will show you in, in a moment. And we thought, this is so interesting. It's really like Shilora Kambos. Just to show you the chicken pit. So in 98, I have another story to tell you about my students. Every single lecture, at the end of it, I would ask them, do you have any questions? All of them would raise their hands. When are we going to excavate? <laughs> I was saying, no, excavation is like operating when you go to the doctor. Do they operate you first? No, they don't operate you. So once, twice, three times, it was never ending. And I said, okay then, we're not going to excavate, but we're going to sieve. 
So in 99, we used the junior school in the village. We talked to the schoolmaster. They allowed us to use the classrooms. We were sleeping in very thin mattresses, taking a shower outside with a, through a hose, and cooking our own meals. And everybody brought something, and I chucked in my salary, and we sieved. And this sieving was a very crucial because we have found, and one of those students are here today, and this this sieving proved that we had 400 plates of obsidian, we had petrolites, and we had many other animal bones, which was showing that this site is very important. We went to the Department of Antiquities and said, look, this is a very important site, you have to protect it. The answer was, no, we need to have architecture remains to protect the site. So we started our excavations the year after. This is the site. Now this is the problem. There is a platform here, a house here, another house here, another house here. You see the problem? I have really very little to show you. It's not like classical things. And our remains, like this one, it's a mud brick. It's the oldest mud brick that's been discovered so far in the island mud brick and the mortar. And we prehistorians need to destroy this, excavate this, in order to understand what it is. So all our information that we are going to give you in terms of physical matter will have to be destroyed. So everything relies on analysis, everything relies on destroying. And furthermore, these post holes, to understand it, we needed to excavate it all the way down. Uh, the houses we found at Tatlusu, we found uh, six of them. They had stone foundations, mud brick walls. Both inside and outside, all the walls were plastered and painted either brown, dark brown, red. In some cases, we found also yellow colors. Outside, they had these basins that was plaster lined and it's called the pot boilers. You basically heat your stone and throw it in to cook your materials because this is a time when there is no pottery. We have a ditch. We don't know what the ditch is, but I can talk about religion for you if you like because that's, that's where, what archaeologists do. When we don't understand something, we talk about religion. <laughs> but this is basically a municipal ditch that every time they want to get rid of something, they dumped it in. And we archaeologists love old rubbish bins. So here is, uh, it's, uh, majority of our artifacts come from this ditch. The obsidian, volcanic glass, origin from Anatolia and also from eastern Turkey. We have found now about 4,000 blades. 4,000 blades is the largest number of obsidian you can find anywhere outside Anatolia. And in Anatolia, needless to say, not far from, you can see within the distance, this is the Taurus Mountains of Turkey. And in Anatolia, there is a workshop of obsidian where they were making these blades. And in this workshop, there are two kinds of technology that's been discovered. One of them is the Anatolian one, that Anatolian prehistoric people are using and cutting. And the other one, they didn't know where it went, basically. They found rejects, but not the artifacts. Well, I have news for you. We have those artifacts. So what better evidence to show where Taposu people, Akatu people, may have come from? Again, I want to show you the Taurus Mountains. On a clear day, you see it. We have other advantages, not just visibility, but also the currents. The currents don't change from prehistoric times. These are related to heating of the water, they are related to the winds as well, but the sea currents more or less are same depending on the seasons. And I just wanted to show you this circle that goes round and round near Akatu. And you may have heard recently that a boat of refugees ended up in the Akatu. They got drifted. 
As simple as that. So how did they came to the island? What kind of vessels they had 10,000 years ago? Well, these <coughs> little items that we found uh, at the excavation are pointing out to a guafa type of uh, vessels that they had. They're simple. They're made of branches woven like a basket, covered with leather and then with fat to make it uh, waterproof. Now, this is an example from the Tigris River. And we know that Herodotus recorded it in, for, for in the 5th century BC about uh, Armenians coming down with these kind of boats down the river with their goods and inside having a donkey as well. And then after selling their goods, they dismantle the boat, they sell the material of the boat as well, and then they ride back on their donkey, back to where they came from. Another one, this one also, a picrolite object. Uh, this photo is taken in Tibet. Uh, I was fortunate enough to take a ride in it. It looks scary when you first put your foot in it because it kind of bounces back, but it is solid. I can tell you it's very solid. And it's, uh, it's the most simplest and the sensible thing you can construct to use. So these are the kind of vessels we think they came from. Animals, these animals, neither of these animals uh, existed on the island before. So some archaeologists are thinking it came as a package to Cyprus. We have a lot of deer, as you can see. Uh, we have some cattle, which disappeared later. We have white pig, normal stuff, dog, um, fox, and just recently, we also have cats. But ours is a wild cat, and we are very happy about this discovery uh, because, as I mentioned to you before, if obsidian came from Anatolia, then we know that this cat may have also came from Anatolia because the type we have is an Anatolian wild cat. And it's linked to Göbekli Tepe. It's the same kind of. My archaeologist is also working at Göbekli Tepe, and her discovery says that it's connected there. And we know these people were in contact in those times. There are other animals, marine animals. We have also hooks. Uh, we have a lot of turtles that they uh, they must have been taken from the beach at the season. Large fishes like tuna, so there is no doubt that these people were very confident sailors. We also have sinkers, so perhaps they've used some kind of nets or baskets. And I, I think fishing is another interesting thing. If you go to crazy places like Greenland, they are using different kind of fishing methods to catch fish. If you go to the Papua New Guinea, they are doing something else. But it's, it's very interesting how people, humans, adapt to their environment when they're hungry to catch the food. And this is to show you that we have uh, complete carcasses of turtles, which is dazzling because if they're not throwing it into parts to eat, then what is happening? Some kind of ritual? Botanical remains? Again, I mean, how much of the botanical remains you can show to people when they come to visit your site or your, your museum? We have wild olive, we have uh, pistachio, wild pistachio. We have also lentils, which is again Anatolian pointing to the Anatolian direction. We have stone tools whether it be for grinding uh, wheat, wild wheat, or other, other collected uh, stuff from the nature, which is very, uh, very fertile. As you know, our mayor in the area is doing Ot Festival every year, and there are a lot of wild, um, wild uh, food you can collect in the environment. And in the prehistoric time, they would have been even more. We have fragments, not even one complete bowl, fragments of bowls. And we have bone artifacts, small, again, shell beads, variety of them, they're drilling, so we know, kind of. So we are creating some kind of idea of what they were wearing, what they were doing, but 
and the tokens, uh, objects or symbols. I'll give you one, one secret of, of archaeologists. If we say objects or symbols, it actually means we haven't got the faintest idea of what they are. <laughs> We also have other objects, materials, that came from somewhere else, but it's too early to talk about it yet. Carnelian, we know it's Afghanistan, but I think we cannot really talk that these people came from Afghanistan, maybe through some routes, but first we have to explore the resources near us. Human remains, well, they are really remains, we have no graves. So we don't even have a grave in Tablosu that we can reconstruct and show it to people, unlike Kirakitia. But what we can do with these remains is we can do ancient DNA to understand if these people are related to the Anatolian one. Now, DNA, ancient DNA is controversial study. You need to be careful. But what we're trying to do with a team from Metu in Ankara, is we're trying to find a distribution of the farmers from central Anatolia from the Fertile Crescent. And our partners are Bonjuklu in Turkey and Çatalhöyük, and in, in collaboration with the Swedish universities, we're trying to find out these peoples, the spread of these people, dispersal of the farming. But for Cyprus, it's particularly interesting because it might indicate where culturally these people belong to. Now from physical study, we know that they were not very tall, they didn't live very long during this time, and they were really built uh, strongly. This is all I can tell you about the human race. So, what can you do? You excavate your site, then it's your job to declare it ancient monument. So, it was only in 2009, I reported this site in 1996, we did our first excavations in 2000, and it was not until 2009 that the three acres of land, shown in yellow, was declared ancient monument. Now we were lucky because it was government land. If it was private, this would be an impossible task. But please, just bear in mind, 96, 99, 2000, 2005, 2009. Okay, you, you do the mathematics of how long it <coughs> took uh, Department of Antiquities and the relevant institutions to declare this important site an ancient monument. Now we have news for them. We want to expand the area, <laughs> more than 3,000. We want to include underwater archaeology, we want to include nature, we want to include animals that are there. Because it's been declared ancient monument since 2000, you cannot leave the kind of vegetation flowers you see that's blooming in the area. The hares, the partridges, all kinds of migrating birds, they're stopping on the way. What a beautiful area to preserve. We are now uh, to no more, no more Nobody's talking about the natural park in Karpas anymore. So I decided we've got to do something at least about this particular area. So this season's survey work, it's endless. This season's survey work, and when I say survey, you just get your rack sack, you put some uh, fruit in it and you start walking around. What a, what a wonderful job I have. I get to hike and I get to do my job. But then you do occasionally, but more often, uh, fall into areas where there are heads of statues, and this is actually very similar to the ones in Karpas. So there, it's probably, it's too early to talk about it, but probably an area where they were making uh, sculptures, and sculpture workshop. And most people would walk past this, but this is a grinder, and it belongs to a prehistoric site. Now, Tatlusu, the area that I indicated, which stretches for about 10 kilometers, it has 10,000 years of history, starting from the Neolithic site of Tatlusu, uh, the excavation we have, then it goes into Calculatic period and the Bronze Ages, and following it all the way to the churches. We have Bronze Ages, and we also have recent economic, the Karab stores. So what a wonderful area where you can walk, you can enjoy the nature, 
you can see the animals and plants and also learn about your, your history of the island. Just one picture, I promise, these are endless, but look at this beauty that you have on the coastline. And when you're walking here, hares are jumping in front of you and giving you a scare, but first you go, wow, and then you go, ah, and then you are too late to take your camera out. We have another problem with Tatlusu, and that is after excavation. How can we preserve it? For many years we used the plastic bag over, that is used, it's the same stuff that's used for the um, greenhouses. But usually when you use this, you have to backfill it with soil so no um, light goes through. Well, we were very hopeful last time we did this. We thought we would have more funding. We didn't, and this is what happened to it. So preservation of a prehistoric site after excavation is a big issue. This year, we've been advised by conservators to use a different kind of material. We will see uh, what's going to happen. But what needs this kind of site needs is a roof over it. This is also a controversial thing. Should we roof or should we not roof? What kind of roof? Well, roof should represent part of the site because once architects build it, it becomes part of the site. And believe me, most people will come to see the roof you will build. One day maybe one of you will be part of a project like this. It needs to be low maintenance. It needs to not destroy archaeology. Here is a challenge for you, a homework. Uh, it needs to be built in such a way that birds will not come and land inside or get inside. This is a big challenge. You have to think of the wind, you have to think of the light, because most of the time, archaeological sites are away from electricity and these kind of sources. So you have to design something that it will allow inside a light and many other things. So let's have a look at the examples we have. It all has to do with budget. This is Gobekli Tepe. This was Gebekli Tepe. Now I understand they have a magnificent roof, but I haven't visited it yet. This is Chatel Huyuk. It's one of the richest prehistoric sites in the world. They are working with big, big budgets. This is in the south uh, at Tenta. I like this one, and I want to make a point here. This Tenta one, it's been built in a shape of tent, because tenta means tent. Apparently, St. Helena, when he was passing by, he stopped on this hill and he set up his tent, so the area was called tent. And I congratulate the architect, he thought of this idea. Problem? Birds everywhere. So having had all these problems of what are we going to show people, and when our visitors were coming to site, and I was taking them around when I was there, showing them here two stones are a hut, a house, and here is this and that. People always looked at us with, what are you talking about? I don't see it, I don't believe you. No, it's not. Look, so we decided we'll build one reconstruction. So in 2005, September 2005, we got a grant from UNDPPFF I've taken time off from university here, unpaid leave. It was the time it was getting, I was getting an itchy foot, thinking time to move on. And with my students, some of them graduated at the time and were unemployed. And also Ismail Jamal, most of you must, uh, must know from Bill Connor, we built our team and we tackled this project. Now most of the time, <coughs> archaeologists use archaeological evidences when they are doing reconstruction because it has to be realistic, it has to be correct because when somebody comes, when they look at it, a picture is worth a thousand words they will have a photographic memory of that and it's our responsibility as archaeologists to do it correctly otherwise you'll come there, you'll think it's like that and you'll live there forever impressed in your memory that the house is like that or whatever reconstruction we have done so one, excavation remains. The other, we're not so lucky, but this is a calcolithic site in the south. 
excavated by one of my PhD supervisors, late Eddie Peltenberg. They found a model of a house. I mean, how lucky can you get? This is a model of a house, and it's even showing the paintings inside the house. And this is its little door. So this made them build every construction of one giant houses that using the archaeological evidence for the sizes, but also using the evidences that you don't have anymore from the walls and decorations. And here it is. And uh, Eddie Peltenberg's work at Lemba was the first reconstruction in the 1986 in Cyprus. So having worked with my professor, I thought, well, not in the south, but having worked with him in Edinburgh, I thought, well, okay, let's, let's, let's try to do this as well together. So we collected local materials from the neighboring fields. Don't forget, these people don't have large animals to carry heavy loads, so you have to use the nearby resources. And we started making hundreds of mud bricks. We recorded everything we have done photographically, by writing, and filmed it as well. And we've <coughs> we enjoyed ourselves as well, most important of all, by mixing the mud. And we gained a lot of experience while building this. And it has become in such a way that when our visitors started coming, they would go directly to this hut and not to the excavation. So, some of the evidences to show you, this is from Tatlusu, is the impression of the of the uh, roof, the cane. You can see how it's happening here. So when, also please note the burnt sides of the wood. This is juniper. Juniper is a very hard wood, and when you burn, when you cut it, it's very difficult to cut. And imagine in the Neolithic you have a stone tool, and you try to cut this. It would be very difficult. You would need to keep changing your axe. So we thought. Wait a second, how about burning? What better cutting tool than burning? So we burned the edges of them to separate it, to get it to right size. Instead of cutting, we burned them. And in the end, it turned out that it is better to burn because it stops insects coming into your wood and uh, destroying them. So we thought one house is okay, but how about a village? You know, human beings, we're never satisfied with what, what we have. So we thought, let's turn this into a village. So we got an artist, gave the plans, he made us reconstruction of it. We thought, yeah, painting is great, but let's do the village. There are examples in Turkey, Aşıklı, uh, Mikriban Özbaşaran, uh, from Istanbul University. There are... Uh, there are great uh, supporters. I have practically every member of her team coming and working on my excavation because after the closure of the department, we have no students. We have money, we have ideas, we have projects, we have no students. So I'm using both her students and also her specialists in, in, uh, uh, at Akantu. So they have done a village, and it's great uh, success. You can see students enjoying themselves. And in one of these days, you know, I always thought, yes, the village, village, village. Uh, one day, a group <coughs> came from medical university to do some kind of a workshop in Biukono. We met, I gave them a lecture, and then I said, well, you should come and see what we did in the excavation. And again, I was heading to the trench, and they were heading to the house. And then I told them all my inspirations that I like to do the village and so on. And a couple of days later, they sent me an email saying, would you like us to do something? Would you like us to draw something? Some ideas on a piece of paper. And I said, yes, of course, why not? And uh, particularly Gülhan Benli, architect, uh, she is leading the group. And they have come with uh, great uh, uh, projects and we are now collaborating in this. It's been collaboration with Medipol, Tatlusu municipality, uh, you, 
International Cyprus University, imagine I, lost, I forgot the name of my own university, and, and uh, excavation. We all need these partners for different reasons. But before we established our borders or where we are going to do the houses, huts, we explored the ground with geophysics. This is very important. Although the project is not initially going to hurt the archaeology, it's important to show that you are doing utmost everything uh, before you start your project. So we had a radar, ground penetration radar, and we also had magnetometer. Ground penetration radar is looking at the pits and ditches, things that's been caved out, dug out, and backfilled. And um, magnetometer is looking at burnt stuff. So when we did this, as you can see, the area is huge, the archaeological area. But we are okay in this area. Looking at it from here, this is the excavation. This is our prototype hut. And this is the farmhouses of the chickens and pigs previously. And all this is actually, as you can see, our center is here. And the medical university came up with the idea that we can develop all these buildings into, rehabilitate them and turn them into a kind of visiting center and the archaeo park and so on. So looking at these buildings from close by, um, they're okay, they're standing, the engineer said they, they are fine, they're narrow, they're nothing special, but because we declared an ancient monument, we cannot build new things there. Inside is like this. <coughs> so this is all the talking and finally <laughs> the title of the talk, the Archeo Park. Now, when Medical University team said to me, we'd like to design something and we'd like you to visit us when we are ready in Istanbul and we can discuss it, I let them free. I said, do what you want. I'm not going to interfere with your creativity. Because if I start saying, oh, you know, archaeologists don't dig there, don't do this, you know, as we are all, always uh, like this, it would have been uh, problematic. So I let them free. When they shared the uh, project with me, first things first, we have no pottery on site, this beautiful design. It's in the shape of a pottery. So that was first thing that I kind of interfered with. Um, they said, that's not a problem, we can change it. I said, how much would something like this cost? And they said, about 1 million euro, 1 million euro, just for the materials. Now, if you're watching BBC, Arte, TV Mod every morning like I do, and you see all kind of suffering around the world, you don't want to spend this money on a heritage. Yes, I'm an archaeologist. Yes, I want to, I want to protect this site. But one million euro, I thought of it, what can be done? And I thought, okay, we have to think of something else for the roof. A, I can't get this money. B, even if I can, I'm not sure I want to put it there. I prefer to uh, backfill it. Now, the villages, the village will be here, but we've actually moved it here between the two fig figs that's coming out. The site's Greek name, Arkosko, means wild fig. So we thought, hey, great, why don't we make use of these <coughs> fig trees? There are the cafeteria area, and uh, also what we want to do is archaeologists working, working uh, as uh, archaeologists working as people are visiting, so we can have this interaction with them. So there will be an experimental digging area for children, workshops. Um, I moved to car park as well, uh, to their dismay, I said, let the people walk. So I moved it out of the way. Uh, and the souvenirs, everything is going to be selected. I don't want some made in China souvenirs. The village actually has a workshop of women uh, doing this. So we have a lot of kids visiting. And uh, I get the most intelligent questions from these kids. When we are excavating, it's not a problem. There is uh, flint work. We, we show them the flint work. We show them how we retrieve botanics, and they were very interested. And we made a little exhibition where 
Uh, this is my, my niece. She makes she makes a big deal when I go away traveling or when I go away to excavation. She refuses to talk to me. And it was one of these days they came and she was not talking to me. She was making a point. You go away. I don't see you. And we showed, it was the day embassy came to see what we are doing, Turkish embassy. And then we came up and it was the first thing she said to me. Auntie, is this the world you talked about downstairs? And I thought... I would have never thought of explaining it like this way. So kids, we have to listen to the kids when we are doing things like this. So looking at samples around the world, uh, public archaeology events, uh, weekends, uh, where you can do workshops and events for children. Uh, this is Bill. Bill is in, in UK. This is his job and he also acts in the films as well as a Paleolithic man. He teaches kids how to crawl on the ground and to to hunt. Um, these are examples from Aşıklı, where Mihri, Professor Mihribat Özbaşaran is doing. Uh, kids are making models of the houses. They are also printing on the bags, not just the houses that they are finding, but also the vegetation and animals that lived on the area. And there are also uh, films shown or discussions and archaeologists always present there. And uh, this is uh, Again, the, the plants, uh, they're collecting seeds and they're planting for experimental farming. And just to give you an idea, Chitlemit bag and people are making this. And this is in Tatlusu actually. We have everything in this village. We have women's workshop where they're already making handicrafts. So why shouldn't they make handicrafts and sell it in the souvenir shop? But we archaeologists and the architects have to dictate them what they can do and what they cannot do. I don't want just anything to be sold there because it sells. It needs to be specifically for, for the site. And for your door, if you like, we can make you a number with uh, the site. So, we have the guests. They're ready, they're visiting, they're asking good questions. And this year, because it's seasonal, we collected the cane I, for, to build 11 houses and we have to make 100,000 mud bricks to build our 11 houses. We collected the timber, we burnt them, they're ready. So we're halfway there. And although majority of you romantizes our job as an archaeologist, yeah, a raksa, going around finding sites, well, sometimes our job is very difficult, and one of these days I was running around in the excavation, there's no onion going to the market, the workman was not doing it, the, the uh, lab, I was trying to fix the lab, things didn't arrive, there was problems, I was running around, and one of my Japanese friends who comes every year and all the way from Japan to join our excavation said to me, Muge, if something is half done in Cyprus, it's a success. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>